So the first thing we have to study is what we call the deformation gradient. And we talked about deformations in the, the previous uh, lecture, at the end of the previous lecture, and what we were interested in is how the object deforms in space. <coughs> and what we are interested in here in particular is if I draw a tangent or a tangent to a material line, by a material line I mean a line of representing some physical points on the object. And I'm tracing those physical points on the deformed configuration. 
What I'm interested in is if I draw a tangent here, where does this tangent go? Now a tangent on any line, now a line is represented by a one parameter family of vectors as we talked about last time. One parameter family of vectors means this line, if I call it, if I give parameter xc that tells me the length or the distance along this line, then every point is represented by the component x1 of xc, x2 of xc, x3 of xc. This gives me give a, a relationship between this xc and this, the coordinates of that line. If I would like to know the tangent at any point, all I have to know is the derivative of this x with respect to xc. That gives me three vectors, the uh, three components, partial x1 by partial xc, partial x2 by partial xc, partial x3 by partial xc, and that gives me the direction of that tangent. Now what happens to this tangent in the deformed the configuration after the material deformed? x, the new component, is equal to x1 of the original point. The original point was called x of xc and also a function of time. And we'll preserve the, the motions that are function in time until the end of the lecture. So x is equal to x1 of capital X, X2 of capital X, X3 of capital X, and then tangent here is equal to partial X by partial XC. But X is already a function of capital X's, so I'm going to take partial X by partial capital X. Now X is a function of X1, X2, and X3, and so I'm going to take partial X1 by partial capital X1, multiplied by partial X1 by partial X3 plus partial x1 to partial x2 multiplied by partial x2 by partial xc and so on and once I do this I'm going to get this matrix that I'm going to call the deformation gradient the gradient of the deformation multiplied by the original vector n because that's the original vector in the undeformed configuration so basically if I draw any vector here And if I know the motion, x as a function of capital X, if I know the deformation gradient, which is the gradient of this function with respect to x, then I will, by multiplying f, this capital F, <coughs> by n, you get this, how this vector deforms. Now, this deformation gradient contains everything that I need to know in terms of changes in length and changes in volume. So, if if I have three vectors, if this is my object and I have three vectors here, u v and w, local vectors on the object, three linearly independent vectors, which means they make a small cube on the object, then after deformation, these three vectors become f u, f v, and f w, where f is the partial x i by partial x j, is this matrix of uh, the gradient of the deformation. So, what do we know about the determinant of f? The determinant of f, as we studied earlier, is equal to the new volume So the determinant of f 
is equal to the new volume divided by the original volume. So if, if I know f, I know whether this, this deformation is increasing in volume or decreasing in volume locally. Just by knowing f at every point, I know at this particular point, is the material being squished or is it being expanded? I also know if I have two vectors here, u and v, which give me an area and a perpendicular vector equal to am, I know how the area changes. I don't remember. I think I think that's correct. Do you remember the formula? Yeah, that's you didn't for the previous assignment. That's correct. Is that correct? So I, if I know f and the inverse of it and it's transposed, so if I know f, I know what I can put here, and I know how areas change as the object deforms. Some materials, as they deform, for example, rubber, as it deforms, it keeps its volume. So locally, it keeps its volume. If you squish it, it's just uh, it, it, it deforms a lot, but the, the, the volume is a constant, and so. The determinant of f, which we are going to call j, is equal to constant, is equal to 1. And this motion I call isochoric motion. the difference between an object that deforms uniformly, so let's say I have this original object that deforms uniformly, like this, and another object Once it deforms, it does something like this. This is another object that deforms like this. <coughs> so the first one we call it a homogeneous F. 
what's a homogeneous f? f is constant at every point. The local volume changes here is equal to the local volume changes here, and, and so on. If, in fact, x is equal to fx. This is a, a so when you take partial x by partial capital X, you get f. So the new vector x is equal to a matrix multiplied by the original vector x. So f itself does not depend on the position. F is constant throughout the object. You have a, a, an object and you extend it uniformly such that x is equal to f of x or any of the previous uh, the motions, the simple motions that we described in the previous lecture, these are called, these have homogeneous f because f is constant throughout the whole object. If the if I have a nonlinear motion where x is a function, a nonlinear function of x, then f equal to partial small x by partial capital X <coughs> contains functions in x1 and x2 and x3 which gives me a local f at every point not homogeneous As you see here, maybe this area kept its volume, but this area, the volume may be decreased. If I have three vectors right here, they look like they almost kept their directions. Right here, they didn't. So F changes according to the position. This is a non-homogeneous motion. So are there any physical restrictions on the deformation gradient? Now I can put anything as a function of the original position. But physically, I'm, the, the, whatever I'm describing has to describe a, a physical motion. And a physical motion abides by two important things is that if u, v, and w are v, three linearly independent vectors, f u the, the three new vectors have to be linearly independent as well. So what does this tell me? The determinant of f, if you remember, is not equal to zero. Cannot be equal to zero. Because if the determinant of f is equal to zero, that means I've taken a, a, a direction and I squished it. So I take a volume and I make it into a two-dimensional object. So the determinant of f cannot be equal to zero. Also, if I take u, v, and w, if the three u vectors follow a different orientation, then the determinant of f in this case is less than zero. This is physically not physically possible. It's not physically possible because I'm taking an object and I'm turning it inside out or kind of doing a reflection as I'm deforming. So the determinant of f has to be greater than zero. So the restriction is the determinant of that deformation gradient has to be greater than zero. So if I tell you x is equal to x1, x1 is equal to x1, x2 is equal to x2, x3 is equal to x3, is this, uh, sorry, or let's say x3 is equal to negative x3. Is this physically possible or not? Yes, 
fit, it's not possible because I'm taking an object and I'm reflecting it. I'm taking all the x3 coordinates and I'm giving you a, a negative object. So this is physically not possible because in this case, f is equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 negative 1. The determinant of f is equal to negative 1. So the deformation gradient, just this is the problem, just to give to explain to you what the what the function of the deformation gradient is. If I have a vector dx on the object and a vector dy on the object, and another vector z, original vectors on the object, they deform into these three directions. Locally, if I know any other direction here, I will know where this direction is because I'm using a linear, uh, a linear transformation that from these three vectors, I get those three new vectors. So the question is, how can I find f in this problem? Well, f has nine components. So I need nine equations in nine unknowns. And the nine equations are, if this is capital Vx, This is the deformed dx. This is equal to the matrix f multiplied by dx. This is the matrix f that I'm looking for. So basically, equation one, or these are three. These are three equations. capital X, 
the gradient of u is equal to partial x by partial capital X minus partial capital X by partial capital X. Partial capital X by partial capital X means partial x1 by partial x1, partial x1 by partial x2, partial x1 by partial x3. So we end up with f minus i. And this gradient of the displacement is what I'm going to use for my measures of the uh, strain bed, the small strain measure. Because I'm going to take the matrix, the gradient of u, the gradient of u is equal to the matrix with components partial ui by partial xj. And I'm going to decompose it into two matrices. The first one is <coughs> I'm going to call the small strain matrix, which is equal to half the gradient of u plus the gradient of u transpose. So the symmetric part of the gradient of u. And I'm going to take the skew symmetric part, which is half the gradient of u minus the gradient of u transpose. And so any motion, I can now describe it by a part. If you remember the skew symmetric matrices, a skew symmetric matrix is always takes the vector and gives me a vector that's perpendicular to it. If you remember, because dx dot w dx was equal to, because this is equal to its negative transpose, it was equal to negative w dx dot dx. A number is equal to its negative, therefore it's equal to zero, which means they are perpendicular to each other. So I take a vector and give you a component that's perpendicular to it, and another component using a symmetric matrix. So this component describes rotation, and this component describes stretch. So this strain matrix, which is equal to half the gradient of u plus the gradient of u transpose, has components that look like this. Partial u1 by partial x1, half partial u1 by partial x2 plus partial u2 partial x1 even <laughs> and so on half partial u1 by partial x3 plus partial u3 by partial x1 and here you have partial u2 by partial x2 and partial u3 by partial x3. So what are these different components in the matrix? What is this? And what are these? So if I have an object, inside the material under my, the magnifying glass. Because if I look at this small cube inside the material, and if I call this point, that if I say that this side has moved a distance u1, and this side has moved a distance u1 plus a little bit more,
small strain or delta over L naught Sorry, this is the original left x1. This distance is now delta x1 plus this extra bit. So the strain in this direction will be equal to partial u1 by partial x1 multiplied by delta x1 over delta x1. which means that this component, partial E1 by partial X1, gives me the strain in the direction of E1. So if I have a vector in the direction of E1, the first component, or the diagonal, the first diagonal component in that small strain matrix tells me how much this, this vector has stretched, uh, or how much strain there is in that vector. Similarly, this, uh, the, the middle one will give me uh, the, the amount of strain in the direction of E2, and this will give me the amount of strain in E3. Now what about the off-diagonal component? Let's look at the off-diagonal component, and now look at the shear deformation, associated <coughs> with any motion. Again, I look at a very small object under the magnifying glass. This is delta x1. And this is delta x2. As the object deforms, if there is shear deformation, this point has moved upwards u2. This point will have moved upwards u2 plus a little bit more, partially u2 by partial x1, delta x1. If this point has moved horizontally u1, and this point has moved horizontally u1 plus a little bit more, instead of the more is partially u1 by partial x1, sorry, x2 multiplied by delta x2. The shear strain, we describe it using this angle plus this angle. And this angle will be equal to this extra bit divided by delta x1. And this angle will be equal to this extra bit divided by delta x2. And so the shear strain, or the engineering shear strain, which is equal to partially 1 by partial x2 plus partially 2 by partial x1. This is what you studied as your engineering strain uh, in the beginning or in early engineering courses. And this is equal to half, uh, sorry, 2 epsilon 1, 2. So the off diagonal component gives me the shear strain between E1 and E2. So this gives me how much this angle changed, this 90 degrees angle, this 90 degrees angle changed after deformation. This one gives me how the angle between E1 and E3 changed after deformation. And this will give me the angle between E2 and E3. The infinitesimal rotation matrix, which is the skew symmetric part, this is a skew symmetric matrix, so these are going to be zeros. This will be partially u1 by partial x2 minus partially u2 by partial x1. And so on. So what does this give me if I have an object 
that's rotating in space. This point has moved u1, this point has moved u1 plus partial u1 by partial x2, delta x2. And if this point has moved u2, this point has moved u2 minus partial u2 by partial x1 delta x1 and so this gives me half this plus this and so it gives me the angle of rotation around the vector E3 and this would give me the angle of rotation around uh, so this would be partial u1 by partial x3 so around E2, and this will be around E1. So now the first measures of strain that we've defined are epsilon and w. So we've defined that if I have an object that is deforming, at every point I can have two matrices. The first matrix is epsilon, which is equal to half the gradient of u plus the gradient of u transpose. And the second matrix is w, which is equal to half the gradient of u minus the gradient of u transpose. And I'm claiming that these two matrices are very good in describing the strain. <coughs> Describing strain and rotation for small deformation, but for larger uh, deformation, they were, are not very good, as we will see. A different, so, a cube of unit net has one vertex situated at the origin of the coordinate system and three sides situated along the three orthonormal basis vectors E1, E2, and E3. And then deformation is applied such that the cube rotates around an axis of rotation U that's equal to 1, 1, 1. And it's rotating with an angle theta. Find the infinitesimal instantaneous rotation group tensor and the infinitesimal strain tensor at theta equal 1 degrees and theta equal 45 degrees. And from uh, the skew symmetric matrix W, we need to recalculate the angle of rotation and the axial vector. So, The displacement of the object is described using rotation matrix Qx. And this, in this example, I use rotation matrix in mathematics. Of theta around 1, 1, 1. F is equal to Q.
the small stream matrix is equal to half the gradient to u plus the gradient to u transpose half q minus i half q plus q transpose minus 2i w is equal to half the gradient to u minus the gradient to u transpose this will be equal to half q minus q transpose so at very small rotation when theta is equal to 1 so we need to calculate both those matrices at theta equal 1 and at theta equal 45 degrees. At theta equal 1, you'll find that A small is almost equal to 0, which is what I want it to be. I want this string matrix to be equal to 0 when I have rotation. And the axial vector of the skew symmetric matrix or the norm of the axial vector of the skew symmetric matrix will give me the one degree. degrees, you'll find epsilon small is not equal to zero, which means that this matrix, I cannot use it to predict any strain, and the norm of the axial vector will not be equal to the 45 degrees. So at larger rotations, I cannot use the, these two measures to describe my, uh, the, the deformation of the option. So there's another problem that you should also look at that uh, shows the, what the function of P is and what the function of W is. So is there a better uh, measure for describing rotations and stretches in larger deformations? So I'm just going to go just to the figure to explain to you what I'm going to be trying to do uh, now. Any deformation, I can look at it as if it is a combination, as I said, of a stretch and then a rotation. The stretch is performed along the eigenvectors of, the, of a symmetric matrix and then a rotation matrix takes whatever object I have stretched and does a rotation to it. In this case, to go from here to here, I'm describing this using the deformation gradient f, and we're claiming that f can be decomposed in first I apply u to any vector, then after I apply u to the vector, I take the new vector and I rotate it. Or, we can also see the same motion as if first I take those two vectors 
for all these vectors and I do a rotation. So first I apply a rotation. And then after I apply the rotation, I apply extension using a symmetric matrix, V. And I'm claiming that this R is equal to this R. And I'm also claiming that U and V are positive, definite, symmetric matrices. So basically, I'm claiming, yeah, positive, definite, symmetric matrices, and the decomposition F is equal to RU, which is equal to VR, is unique. What is it? What does all this mean? It means, so, the following. So, let's just maybe start by an example. I is equal to the identity matrix is equal to 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. <coughs> you can look at it as if it's the multiplication of the rotation matrix 1. So here, this is F. This is a rotation matrix, and this is a positive definite <coughs> symmetric matrix. Now this decomposition is unique. Why is it unique? Well, let's try any other matrices that when I multiply them by each other, I get this I. You can, one of them is rotation and the other one is a symmetric matrix. I can put here negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. This has to be negative 1, 0. 0, 1, 0. This is symmetric, but not positive depth. This is rotation. Or, let's put here, negative 1 to make it a rotation. So this is a rotation matrix. The other one is symmetric, but it's not positive depth. So I can even find another one. Negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. This will have to be negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Again, this is symmetric but not positive definite. This is a rotation matrix. So I can find a few rotation matrices and a few symmetric matrices such that F is equal to RU, but only one such that I can. R is a rotation and U is positive definite symmetric matrix. There's another example that I have in the book. One sec, let me find it. Or So, what we're saying is any matrix F, I can find a rotation matrix, one rotation matrix and one positive definite symmetric matrix that describe for this F. Now, in real numbers, this is equivalent to saying if I have any real number, this is equal to a number that tells me something about the sign multiplied by a positive number that can be obtained by multiplying this number by itself and taking the square root. Seven is equal to one, the square root of this number by itself. Negative 50 is equal to negative one of 
multiplied by the square root of negative 50, negative 50. What I'm doing here for real numbers, now because this is this positive square root is always unique. It's unique for the real numbers. We are going to show that this also applies for matrices. For matrices, I'm able to find a one square root of something, and that, and we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll first give you five minutes, and then we're going to go through some rigorous proofs. So I want you to be awake. <laughs> Thank you.